Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips. A few announcements before I start. Um, just a few days, less than two weeks, Dr. Bregan, Dr. Peter Bregan will be here uh, to spend four days with us filming some lectures and 25 very lucky people, we have a few spots left, are going to be able to spend time with him, um, having dinner with him on Friday night, watching the lectures, getting to ask questions. Um, it's a very unique experience and anybody who takes our um, how and uh, why and how to uh, withdraw from psychiatric drug uh, course later. We'll only watch these uh, lectures on video. There will never, never again be a chance to spend all this time with Dr. Bragan while they're being filmed. So um, if you want to learn about um, the real definition of these various conditions and what these drugs really do and how to safely withdraw from them either because you're interested as a health professional or you are on the drugs or you have a family member who's on the drugs you definitely want to be here for that four days I'm so looking forward to this I've spent a lot of time with Dr. Bragg and I've read I don't know three quarters of his 20 some books that he's written and um, every time I read a new book every time I hear him speak I learn something new and then um, the other announcement, summer semester, and I can't believe we're talking about it already, but the flowers are blooming here in Columbus, although I have to say my yard has spent the last couple of weeks, or months rather, being very confused because it's 65 degrees, and then it's 20 degrees, and then it's 65 degrees, so stuff blooms, and then it stops. But anyway, it really is going to be summer very soon, thankfully. That's my favorite time of year. And summer semester, diet and lifestyle intervention course with the celebrity instructors like Dr. Esselstyn, Dr. Barnard, Dr. Goldhammer, Dr. Moss, um, all the great people you want to learn from. And uh, I'm teaching a course on diet, cancer, and cancer treatment uh, this summer also uh, that you might have some interest in. After I teach it this one time, it goes to video. So this is another you know, one chance to do it live, and then after that, not so much. All right, so I've got a couple topics that are diet related today, and the first one I'm going to cover is kind of easy. Here it is. Here's the headline. Drinking milk will shorten your lifespan. Really, truly, that's what the research says. The Swedish study shows that drinking milk increases inflammation and can even shorten lifespan. So the researchers looked at data for over 106,000 adults in Sweden, evaluated their diet and lifestyle habits, and here was the bottom line. Women who consumed three or more glasses of milk and ate fruits and vegetables once per day had a three times higher risk of premature death than women who drank no more than one glass of milk per day and consumed fruits and vegetables at least five times per day. The researchers found that fruit and vegetables offered some protection from the oxidative stress and inflammation caused by milk drinking. However, increasing fruit and vegetable intake was not shown to reduce risks associated with milk consumption entirely. Women who consume three glasses of milk per day and ate fruits and vegetables at least five, five times a day still had a 60% greater risk of earlier death as compared to women who ate the same amount of fruits and vegetables and consumed no milk. In other words, eating more plants uh, reduces risk some, but what reduces the risk most is if you just stop drinking the milk and eating dairy products. The researchers reported that even one to two glasses of milk per day increase the risk of premature death, okay? For men, the risk of milk drinking increased the risk of premature death by 30%, not quite as much as women, uh, but still high. And the authors noted that the study confirmed previous research which showed um, higher premature mortality rates with milk consumption. This isn't a single study. Several studies have shown the same thing. The mechanism of action in this case was identified as oxidative stress caused by milk intake due to the lactose, which is a component of lactose. Human breast milk, by the way, contains lactose, but as we mature, and this is the way it is for most people on the planet, the capacity to break down lactose properly goes away, and that's why we should transition to drinking water and get the milk and dairy products out of the diet. So breast milk, appropriate for babies, but discontinuing milk drinking after weaning is the best way to protect your health. All right, other topic. This issue of sodium intake comes up again and again. And sometimes you hear me cover these topics um, often. And one of the reasons is because they are um, hot topics that people write to me about. They get a lot of conflicting information, and so it is with the salt issue. The prevailing thought remains that extreme sodium restriction is an important strategy for reducing the risk of cardiovascular disease and events like heart attack, stroke, and death. But many studies don't support extreme sodium restriction, and many show that doing so can increase rather than decrease the events, uh, the risk of events and death. 
So just to start, researchers conducting the heart failure adherence and retention trial enrolled 902 patients with heart failure and who also had symptoms, then followed them for an average of six months, and data, showed, data analysis showed that patients who restricted sodium to 2,500 milligrams per day or less had a significantly higher risk of death and or hospitalization for heart failure than patients who consumed more sodium. Those patients at higher risk were those who were not taking an angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker. Now what this may mean is that sodium restriction to the extent that it's warranted for some people may be appropriate when made to patients with very specific circumstances as opposed to recommending it to everyone. And I talk about this often, these blanket recommendations that should be much more tailored. Other studies, by the way, have shown potentially negative consequences of um, generalized salt restriction. For example, low salt diets can increase insulin resistance in healthy people. One of the reasons this is an issue that we should be thinking about a lot is the logistics of converting the world's population to low sodium eating. They're absolutely daunting. Globally, most people are consuming between three and six grams of sodium per day, considerably higher than the United States 1.5 to 2.4 grams recommended by uh, the US government, World Health Organization, American Heart Association. I mean, that range is where almost all the quote unquote experts fall. While the common wisdom is that salt restriction is a good idea, uh, not one randomized trial has been conducted to show that reducing salt re results in reduction of cardiovascular events and death. Instead, the medical community has relied on prospective cohort studies which have shown inconsistent relationships between sodium intake and cardiovascular disease and death. In fact, the Institute of Medicine changed its report either last year or the year before, there's an article posted on this in the Health Briefs Library, um, and said when they went back and looked at their original analysis, the definition of high sodium was, was all over the place as to not even be quantifiable, and that um, uh, they retracted their initial uh, position on sodium restriction. Another thing is the relationship between sodium and potassium is generally ignored when looking at the connection between sodium and health outcomes. The average person living in a westernized country consumes more sodium and a whole lot less potassium rich fruits and vegetables, which means the typical ratio of sodium to potassium has been reversed. Low potassium increases the potential negative effects of high sodium intake, making it very difficult to tell if health issues, including cardiovascular disease, develop as a result of low potassium intake, high sodium intake, or both. A 2014 review determined that the sodium to potassium ratio is much more strongly associated with blood pressure and cardiovascular outcomes than either sodium or potassium by themselves in hypertensive patients. There should be more research in this area. But one of the reasons why there hasn't been more research is that investigators that were involved in the DASH diet study reported that their results effectively ended the debate, it was settled, no reason to investigate this anymore. Extreme sodium restriction was good for blood pressure. Now, I've written about the DASH diet before, and I think it's a much better diet than what most people eat. Be happy to see everybody take that step in the right direction. But, but it's a comprehensive diet, and I've never understood how that diet could be used to, to support the idea that salt restriction alone is the path to health. It's not. So as a result of all of this today, health authorities advise that everyone, including healthy people, must, all capital letters here, practice extreme salt restriction. The advice is an example of the many ways in which bad advice is offered, albeit with great intentions sometimes. The tendency for reductionism leads doctors to look for simple solutions to complex problems. In this case, talking to patients about reducing their salt intake is much easier than helping patients to examine and potentially change their entire dietary pattern, including the ratio of sodium to other nutrients like potassium. And one size fits all advice uh, with no consideration of the individual is becoming increasingly common. Um, some people should restrict sodium, uh, some people should not touch alcohol, celiac patients shouldn't eat gluten, and etc. I could go on. But, but the bottom line is that this is different than blanket recommendations to the entire population. Um, that uh, it seems like we're doing, going out of our way to avoid using any type of clinical judgment in advising people about health. And so these current approaches stand in the way of health and health improvement uh, for many people. Restricting salt while otherwise eating a terrible diet doesn't help much at all. 
piling on dietary restrictions for people who don't need them is a detrimental thing in terms of um, it's a barrier to getting people on board to change their diet and it's a barrier to compliance the harder you make this the harder it is for people to stick with it there's a lot of chatter about personalized medicine but my gosh very little of what i see is personalized at all instead it's the quickest easiest reductionist most reductionist thing you can say and then move on to the next person and i think that's a bad idea so here's my stance on salt I think for average healthy people, salt restriction is not necessary. I think converting to a diet which naturally lowers salt because of the extreme reduction in animal foods and dairy products and processed foods, I think that's a good idea. Salt restriction or salt uh, uh, less intake goes down, or salt intake, I'm just trying to say, goes down as a result of that anyway. Um, incidentally, that same dietary pattern increases potassium. For most people, that's all they need to do. For people who are clearly salt sensitive, they retain water or their blood pressure uh, goes up when they eat salt. I, th I think salt restriction is a good idea. But again, if, we, if you've got five or 6% of the population, which has been my experience here, who needs salt restriction, telling the other 94% to do it, not necessarily such a good idea. All right, that's all for today. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it. I'll be back to you on Thursday with more news.